it's a brand new year, and that marks a new season of the Animal Liberation Hour. On behalf of the Animal Activism Mentorship Team, I want to thank all of our remarkable guests from season one for their valuable contributions, and of course, our followers and listeners for their support. We couldn't do what we do without you, and we are ever grateful. AAM is a free multinational program that helps aspiring animal rights activists, as well as those who are already activists, but want to take their activism to a whole nother level. From one-on-one mentorships, to free workshops and trainings, to this podcast, AAM seeks to empower humans to create the world they envision, where all animals are treated with respect and compassion. In our new season for the pod, you can expect more fascinating guests whose diverse stories still share the common goal of creating a compassionate world, and we cannot wait to share them with you. To kickstart season two with the plant-powered bang, I chatted with the outstanding Eloisa Trinidad. Eloisa's activism is limitless, from busting out the megaphone at a disruption to presenting at city council meetings. She instills her vision for an ethical vegan world in all the work that she does. But that doesn't mean she compromises on her own mental, physical, and emotional well-being. It's all about the balance, and Eloisa and I discuss this in depth. We also chat about Eloisa's work in the food justice space and the many organizations that she works with to make accessibility to healthy, whole, plant-based foods easy, a human right, and the norm in our society. After all, none of us are free until we are all free, human and beyond humans alike. I hope Eloisa's vibrant spirit and passion inspires you to explore your own creative forms of being active for the animals and extending your compassion and empathy to all. Enjoy this conversation with the one and only Eloisa Trinidad. Eloisa, it's such a pleasure to have you on and uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to learn about all the different forms of activism you're involved in. Hi, Stray. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here um, and finally meet you and finally (laughs) being able to talk after so much back and forth on the time. I know you're doing a lot and our listeners, I'm sure, are really looking forward to hearing all of the work that you're doing. I know, as I said time and time again, that you are involved in so many different um, arenas of activism, so to speak. And I always like to start with that initial seed that was planted. Um, where that connection with animal rights, animal liberation, veganism first got planted and how you either um, consciously or unconsciously nurtured that seed that has now really evolved into these really diverse areas of activism. Sure. So I really like to credit my mama, my great-great-grandmother, my great-great-grandparents who raised me, uh, who really raised me with an understanding of empathy and taught me about, you know, treating others uh, in a way that is beneficial to them, not just for me. And so that connection um, to the land and to the animals and so on, um, they were not vegan, but I grew up highly plant-based. Um, and so it wasn't such a challenge for me to go from, uh, you know, highly plant-based pescatarian to veganism. And I started that journey really early on. I started it in childhood, um, you know, although my family is completely amazing and just um, really uh, passed on so much ancestral knowledge to me. As a child, you know, I saw the fish that we would catch and I knew that they wanted to live. Um, You know, I knew that they were struggling to get away. 
um, from being used as our food. Um, and so it started really early on, probably around, you know, six or seven years old. And I've always had that connection to our fellow animals. Um, I've always just felt um, sort of an attachment to them. Um, and I never really saw that distinction between the us and them. Um, and so it started from there, from the knowledge that they passed on and just um, exploring my own empathy and what that meant. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. And also how you respect that um, the history while also acknowledging that there still was that little bit of a disconnect, not a 100% um, application of that respect for all life um, when it came to fish. And when you were able to make that connection and use um, that to further fuel your the work that you do in respecting all beings and elevating all of their statuses, which even within animal rights is not necessarily the case where we in a way need to conform by societal standards of, okay, we're going to fight for these larger land animals. Um, and then often it neglect, you know, sea life or the little critters and, um, yeah, it is a conversation that needs to be had and little things that are often overlooked. And yet, I think, you know, having these discussions opens spaces to have um, that awareness. I think that we're all constantly unlearning the speciesism that we've been taught. Um, you know, I have a story of my great great grandfather um, telling me how to eat a fruit, right? That was grown very organically without the organic label, but telling me to take out the little worms and put them back in the earth. And so to me, that was just the most utmost respect for life that you could see, you know, and then, you know, if we were fishing, you know, it was very, it was inconsistent to me. Yeah. And I knew that although what they taught me was such a high level of empathy for all beings. And um, that was really the start of me understanding that I think it's extremely important um, to teach children empathy and to develop um, those capabilities within them. Exactly. And you spoke about the, um, the constant learning and unlearning. So through that process, I would imagine there are going to be some hiccups along the way, you're going to have some fumbles, there will be some mistakes. Um, but you talk but the, the learning angle, you learn from these mistakes. Um, I'm sure there is gratitude in those mistakes that you made along the way. So can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. And always grateful, always grateful for the opportunity to learn. Um, you know, I think as activists, we operate from a sense of urgency and we want to do everything and we want to do it all um, because this is an urgent issue and liberating our fellow animals is an urgent issue. And at times we just spread ourselves too thin and we tend to get our hands in everything and then, you know, burn out very quickly. And so I think what I have learned is to really understand where I'm most effective. Um, and so, you know, we don't have to feel guilty. And, you know, when we say no, we can't do this, or we don't have time for that, because they think being effective is just as important as participating um, in different actions and in different ways of activism. So I'm very grateful um, to be able to have folks around me who help me um, understand that, that there are times where some balls need to drop and to let them drop and to focus on what I'm most effective at. Yeah, and I love that you brought that up because it can be hard to say no, especially when we as activists care so much about the animals. Saying no to something feels like we're saying no to them. And that can be hard and we can push ourselves. We can um, spread ourselves too thin. And in, then we reach a point where we're not even effective for the animals that we are pushing ourselves for. So recognizing that is really important. And again, encouraging people to have these conversations and not feel guilty for always showing up with their 100% 24-7 um, is important. Absolutely. And understanding that we have all have different skills, different talents, and that we all have a place in the fight for liberation. Um, and I think not only understand that within ourselves, but also how we express that empathy to our fellow activists. Mm -hmm. um, I think many times, um, you know, our point of view can be ableist. And, you know, if somebody doesn't show up at a... <laughs> 
at a at an action, then we assume that you know either they don't want to do it or why aren't people coming? And I think we have to really understand nuance within you know what's going on with our folks within activism and so on, and just empower folks to to do what they're good at and um, empower them if they want to take on something different. Uh, but understanding that and, and having empathy and compassion for our fellow activists as well. Totally. So how has this entire process led to the current avenues of activism you're involved in? You're doing so many remarkable things, Eloise. I can't even begin to start gushing over all the stuff you're doing and food justice, climate justice, um, just elevating the ability of those who have been marginalized to access fresh produce. Like you're doing really important work that can be pushed to the sidelines when um, you, when, and I understand that the, the mindset of those who are centering the animals and yes, we are like, they are the victims we want to center in the movement, but that does not mean we push other issues to the sidelines because we can't address one without addressing the other. So how, what are the, all the different forms of activism that you are involved in and what drew you to these different um, uh, genres, so to, so to speak? Um, so in all the activism that I'm involved in, it is all animal liberation related. And I'm very lucky to be able to do that. And I'm very lucky whether I am out on the streets fighting directly for our fellow animals through vegan activist alliance or whether I'm working on food policy um, that I'm able to do that. Um, in all of my work, um, you know, I do take a very anti-colonial and decolonial approach, which I think is really important. Um, you know, the history of veganism is not new. Um, and also the exploitation of animals is not new, is not new but the way that it has evolved um, in the last 529 years, it's something that we have never seen before. And I think it's extremely important and an integral part of any social justice movement to understand how the victims have been um, marginalized um, historically and how they have been excluded um, regardless of what species they are. Um, and I tend to find that within our movement that nuance and those conversations don't usually happen. Um, so my activism really ranges from being out on the streets and grassroots organizing to working on food policy um, in order to um, make uh, plant-based foods more accessible um, to all communities um, and to historically excluded and marginalized communities. Um, and so within that, there's a few organizations that, um, that I am a part of and that I lead. Yeah. So... Um, before we go into that, what um, what kind of campaigns do you work on with Vegan Activist Alliance? I am the executive director at Vegan Activist Alliance and one of the co-founders. Um, and so, you know, for Vegan Activist Alliance, you know our. The reason for our founding is that we believe that all beings should be free and deserve the right to their autonomy and to their bodies, regardless of species. Yeah. Um, and so within that, we understand that there this is a very complex system that exploits animals on all levels. And so we do, we are guided by a collective liberation approach, which does, which does not mean decentering animals. It means understanding how they're oppressed and in every which way. And so the food system, uh, the fashion industry, I mean, there isn't one industry on the planet that doesn't exploit our fellow animals. Uh, we've been very lucky um, to collaborate with various groups. Uh, building community is something that is extremely important to us. Um, we uh, just joined a coalition um, to defund New York horse racing. Um, and so we're working with different Fabulous. groups there as well. Um, and so beyond the street um, outreach, which we call activations, because what we want to do is not just turn people vegan. We want to activate the public to become we active. Love that. We um, love that. <laughs> in yes. fighting for our fellow animals. Um, we try to build community, um, get our activists involved. And I really think it's important to understand uh, policy as well as politics, because the truth is that the lives of these beyond human persons are being decided by all entities across the board. So their government entities as well, that vote every day on what happens to a chicken, a turkey, a pig. Um, and we really can't dismiss that. And so 
we want to bring that information. We want to bring that awareness. And we also want to highlight the folks um, from historically marginalized communities that are doing the work and that have been doing the work for very long, which usually do not get included in the conversations because our activism may look very different, um, which affects everything from, you know, whether um, our work is covered um, and presented in ways or whether or not we receive funding. Um, and so it does affect us across the board. Um, we've been very lucky with VAA that we are actually invited to non-vegan spaces, which to me makes me so happy because yeah, we have especially vegan with the, I know, the, you yeah. have the word vegan in it. <laughs> and activists in the name. Exactly. And so a lot of folks are just like, no, this just is no, terrible. Thank you. <laughs> it's not going to work. No, thank you. And I said, we're going to keep it. And um, I think that, you know, I'm a person that likes to be pragmatic with certain things. And the truth is that when people Google um, certain things, the vegan word has many more hits than plant-based. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think we need to, in, instead of saying, well, th this word already has a negative connotation, it's like, no, we have to own it. Um, let's own it. it. Reclaim, let's reclaim that positivity. It. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just show the world um, who vegans really are, because it's such a diverse group of people. People, even with diverse beliefs. Um, and so, yes, we do activations, we're out on the street, but even within our activations, we try to do things a little differently. Um, so for the New York City elections that just happened, um, we were out there while talking and showing videos talking about for those folks who are, are not going to go vegan overnight, for all of the people that came to our activations to vote for those um, animal forward and animal rights forward mm -hmm. candidates, right? And so if we're out on the street and we're talking, let's talk about the petitions that are there. Let's talk about who's getting elected to these offices that are going to decide what happens to our fellow animals. And I think it's such an opportunity um, to activate folks. And so I don't look at, um, educational outreach just as the way to turn people vegan. Mm -hmm. I look at it as a way to bring in new activists and I look at it as a way to show the public that they can support our work in other ways, right? Because somebody can take three months to go vegan. Uh, some people can do it overnight, but in the meantime, we still want them to be active. We still want them to help us in, which, in whichever way they can. Absolutely. That was so beautifully said. And that's also a great um, segue into uh, with the recent elections that you mentioned and all of the excitement within the plant-based community with um, uh, mayor-elect um, Eric Adams of uh, New York. And that's, that's great uh, within the plant-based community. So what are your thoughts on such collaborations with these plant-forward or animal rights forward um, politicians and actually influencing the community to progress the cause that we're fighting for as opposed to, you know, being, um, I guess, sucked in by the status quo. While also we have, uh, we tend to have this, like you said, anti-colonial, anti-establishment and um, uh, purview and so while working within this political system while also having uh, certain beliefs on how um, society should function do you feel a disconnect or do you see it as an opportunity to um, bring the two together to have a more um, equitable system so I think that you know Eric Adams is plant-based um, mm -hmm. he's not vegan he's not an animal rights um, activist and I think yes. you know it's really important to state that because of the fact that so many people get caught up in it and I just want to get it out of the way yes no um, as I did see a lot of media that said <laughs> yes and vegan, obviously and then mm -hmm. I, I, I and that's when I was like but I thought there were other articles that said that he wasn't you know necessarily quote-unquote animal rights and so I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, right. And so I, I'm of the belief that, you know, politicians are politicians. And so they have a career that they want to further. And, you know, I want to look at where there's opportunity. Um, I think one of the ways that Eric Adams perhaps may make change is within food policy. Mm -hmm. um, and if we need everything we can get yeah. to have a plant, a plant based food system and a fair ju and just transition to a plant based food system. And that's something that we cannot ignore. So while there are many, many issues on the table and on the board when it comes to animal rights in New York City, from horses to um, 
um, you know, ritual animal slaughter that happens here every year um, in slaughterhouses. We have over 80 slaughterhouses in New York City, which most people are not aware of. Um, you know, if that's not what you know, the, our new mayor is going to work on, I think we need to look at what he is going to work on. Um, I'm a huge fan of building coalitions and alliances. I think that we need to grow our movement. I don't think that we're at the stage whatsoever um, to be separating folks that can help us further our work and say, well, you're there because you're plant-based and I'm here because I'm vegan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work on policy and I work with so many people. Some of them are vegan. Um, I work with environmental groups. I mean, you know, you take a coalition that's 50 members, you're bound to have people who are not vegan. And my goal there is to continue to change the food system towards a plant based food system. And I don't have neither the energy, um, nor the time to then point out to one person within that coalition, you're not vegan, therefore, I'm not going to work with you because that doesn't help the animals whatsoever. Um, and so I do think that there are going to be changes in food policy. We do have a city council that is very um, animal forward. And so hopefully with that city council there, we'll be able to do both. And that's my hope. That That's a wonderful point that you brought up with. Um, it's you that building these alliances and coalitions, You it's as much as we would like everyone to check all the boxes that's not feasible nor practicable, very unlikely. So. Um, capitalize on what what connections are going to be fruitful. For example, in this case, the food policy at, with Eric Adams, and then your the pro animal or uh, animal rights forward city council to progress the the horse carriages, etc. So, yeah, knowing um, and knowing that and being smart about these alliances is really crucial. So it's great that you um, touched on that, and we can. Uh, I guess take that to talking about food policy then with your your work with uh, Chili's on Wheels and um, the community fridge, the vegan community fridge that you have. Um, tell us about the inspiration behind um, all of uh, these projects that you are involved in. So Chili Sun Wheels was founded, I think at this point, we may be eight years old, uh, by Michelle Carrera, mm -hmm. by her and her son. And she basically was looking for um, a vegan soup kitchen because she wanted to help out folks in need. It didn't exist, so she created one. Um, and so I think um, folks who are historically marginalized have a history of just creating those spaces when we don't see them. And so that's exactly what she did. And it turned into a network. We are um, not just in New York. York, we're in Hawaii, we're in Puerto Rico, um, we're across um, the country. And um, the work that we do is um, work to make veganism accessible to communities in need. Um, we have done work from a uh, hurricane relief in Puerto Rico to recently here. Uh, when I started that community fridge, I had expanded, um, ex sorry, expanded um, our work to include direct fruit relief to students. So we really um, looked at for those folks who were living in communities that are the most food insecure and the most housing insecure. Um, and so we expanded that. We have been distributing directly at schools, directly with uh, grocery delivery. Um, and while, you know, the activism world was really quiet during that pandemic, it was such a great opportunity for us because we were presenting information of veganism as we always do. So we are yeah. through and through a vegan organization, yes. um, centering the animals uh, first and really um, bringing the information to folks as to why, you know, vegan veganism is important. And so it has such a, a great impact. Um, and folks were in need and they were also receiving information. And, you um, it worked great for us. It worked great for them. And we continue to do that work. Um, we also offer mentorships and workshops. So it's not just food relief. It's also providing a space uh, and support for those folks who are transitioning to veganism. And what we do is really based on mutual aid. Um, and so with that is community building. And we don't just look at it as going into a community, giving food, vegan food or plant based food and leaving that community. Um, we empower our folks to get involved, to get active. And a lot of the folks who receive assistance from us are actually um, volunteers, our volunteers as 
well. And so it's really great to see people not only receive um, this assistance, but then become vegan and then become active. And I think food is such a way to connect all of us. And, you know, all of us need to eat, all of us need food mm -hmm. and water and shelter. Those are three ba basic things and connecting with folks through that end um, really is a, a very different approach um, than other types of activism. Definitely. And it has to be sustainable. Like you said, you just don't go somewhere like, okay, hey, here's your vegan food. Like you do, there's a lot more involved, especially when you're transitioning, you need to, you probably don't know how to prepare certain items. And especially if the resources aren't available. Um, and especially with the work that soup kitchens do as well. And providing support to those who are really in need. Um, it goes a long way. And I'm also curious about the work um, with, you know, the like shelters that that do provide support to those experiencing houselessness at a certain point in time, and those who do who don't have access to medical um, care as well, and feeding them such foods that's actually going to nourish them and and keep them healthy, as opposed to feeding them foods that are probably going to send them back to the hospital where they can't afford their care. You know, through Chili Sun Wheels, one of the things that we do is we work with organizations and groups to transition um, their operations to plant-based. And so beyond the direct food relief and beyond working um, to strengthen our communities, we also uh, provide that support. Um, you know, you brought up shelters and so on. Um, we get also a lot of folks who are uh, plant-based or vegan or vegetarian um, that seek us out because we're the only vegan organization in New York City. Um, there, there are other organizations, but they may not have... Um, had meals or they may not have the delivery aspect to it. Um, and so I think within that, we have to always remind ourselves that vegan folks are also part of the equation of people who are in need, right? If, we, if yeah. you have an activist that's working as an activist full time, most of the time they do not have the funds for other things. Um, and we really have to acknowledge that work because it is work. And I know that a lot of folks who are not activists, a lot of times they will get a job. Well, this is this is a job. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're fighting. We're fighting to liberate our fellow beings. Um, and so at uh, Chili Sun Wheels, we do that. Um, and the community fridge actually is around seven shelters, seven um, uh, shelters that are full and the folks come to the fridge um, to get the things that they need. Um, they have different uh, reasons uh, for having dietary restrictions and the fridge is one of the ways in they, which they can meet those needs. Um, it is heartbreaking to see because it is in a location where you see a lot of wealth, then you see the shelters, then you see the unhoused folks. Um, and we, it has been a great success. Um, people are just super motivated by it. It's front of a boxing gym, which I think, what? you know, was one of the reasons why, um, you know, people also paid attention to it because yeah. it's a statement of like, you know, hey, you don't need to eat our fellow animals in order to be strong. Um, you can Art. get your protein from plants. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. so it's it serves so many different purposes. I think it challenges that belief of what gives you strength, what is sustenance, right? And going away from the belief that in order for you to even be an athlete, you have to eat all these animals. Then it serves the purpose of direct food relief. And beyond that, it serves as a, as a conversation piece that's there, that's doing outreach when we're not there, right? So right on the fridge, it lists what is vegan, what is not, what can be, um, what is accepted at the fridge. And I think it introduces to people to what is plant-based nutrition and what is veganism by just reading the fridge itself. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan of campaigns. I've worked on campaigns previously that were focused on the future of food. Um, and so I think that we always need to find ways to um, educate the public because of the fact that we are up against such industries that are so powerful and have so much money. Um, and so while we spend time arguing and discussing between collective liberation and abolitionist and what's welfare, guess what? They're doing so much to influence the public and influence not just the public, but influence policy yeah. and how things move. Um, and so I think it's something for us to keep in mind. And that's why um, we have to empower folks 
you know, to really um, do what they can and, and to be comfortable um, in doing what they can and not shame them and, and so on. Um, and, and keeping, as I said earlier, that empathy towards our fellow activists as well. Definitely. And how do you um, oversee the operations of the fridge, like making sure that the items in are actually vegan? Um, and do you also get any sort of pushback on the fact that, you know, the, the point of the community fridge is to feed people and by saying, oh, we only accept these certain kinds of products, um, you're, you know, kind of put it, you're hindering the ability to actually feed the community. Have you received that kind of pushback? Um, you know, our, at Chili Stone Wheels, our food and our work is so tremendously well received because people know that this is food that is healthy is food that is bright and is colorful and we're wired to know that that is good for us right uh, it's in our dna um and so i think when uh, the fridge made the news obviously uh, social media comments or comments on like this is network news um of <laughs> you know people saying i'm gonna leave the head of a pig in there but that yeah. hasn't happened yeah <laughs> um, and you know people say things like that all the time and it has been extremely well received, um, to say the least. Um, all of our work at Chili Stone Wheels has been extremely well received. And one of the things that, you know, if, if folks do bring that up, like you're limiting um, what folks are eating, the truth is that we're not. We're actually giving them the option because all pantries in New York City serve animal products um, and they serve animals. Um, I should say that the products that come from animal bodies, I, I say an animal product. Um, yes. <laughs> and I love so, that. you know, um, it's important to understand that we're filling a space that is not necessarily uh, filled with, by other uh, food justice organization or food relief work, um, or they may have a challenge for them. Not only are we, you know, providing this, but it also covers folks who um, have food allergies as well, who cannot eat um, all different sorts of food. Um, and a lot of the folks who have dietary restrictions for whatever reason, whether those are philosophical, religious, or because they have a, you know, an illness, do not get brought into the conversation of food security. Um, it's almost like they're pushed aside. And so if you're vegan for whatever reason, you're not being included in that conversation. And that needs to change because we need to understand that we exist, these folks is, exist, and the stakeholders should always be part of the conversation um, on food justice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really remarkable to see the... the I, I, Again, I guess a part of that pushback that you see online could also, you know, it's it's some of that that dissonance that people are made to confront and they feel uncomfortable and they feel like they have to get it out in some way. So sometimes when I see comments like that, I'm like, there something was like something was touched there, something was sparked there, and it's making you uncomfortable. Um, but it's I'm really glad to hear that. Um, you haven't found a pig's head in any of the fridges, which is a relief to hear. <laughs> you know, we do have quality control. So we do yeah. check um, when people leave things for the ingredients. We check that they don't have whey and honey if they're, mm -hmm. if they're leaving something that is packaged. Um, and so there, there is protocol there. And, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is when you detail it, you know, people are reading and they're saying, okay, I, I want to support this. I want to support uh, folks having access to food and healthy food. And everybody has a different definition of healthy food, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I'm talking about plant-based foods because mm -hmm. within, within the food policy, food justice space, you'll find 20 different definition of what is healthy food. And a lot of times that includes, you know, your grass-fed beef and your yep, eggs and, and so your on happy exactly. free range chicken and exactly yeah. and so you know it's it's interesting to be in these spaces where people are advocating for certain things but it's always about finding common ground where can we meet so we can further this goal and my goal is always liberation i feel that all beings should be free regardless of species and you know i'm gonna do whatever i can to further that goal yeah um but something that you said really got me thinking down the path of what's considered, you know, healthy food. And when there are conversations that are advocating for, yes, school kids should be fed healthy, nourishing foods. There's so much support for that. And you're like, food policy has to reflect 
nutrition um, guidelines. There's so much support for that. But as soon as that involves the removal or even the decrease of animal products, that becomes a whole, you're taking away my meat. This is fascism. Like, you can't tell me what to do. Um, I need choice. This is communism, yada, yada, yada. Like, you hear all of that. How do you, how would you suggest one response to this? Or at least in the spaces that you are, especially as far as food policy goes, have you encountered that? And do you have a, um, a response that you know, gets people to say that, okay, if I want healthy food, I need to get on board with this? I'm very lucky to work with folks that understand that the future um, it, for food and for everything, the environment and for our fellow animals um, is a just and fair plant-based food system when, wherever we can um, do that. And so, you know, one of the things that um, I really like to talk about is, you know, subsidies, which I think a lot of vegans are becoming more aware of. Um, and so when we talk about access to food, the truth is that a lot of folks um, have access to very inexpensive uh, uh, animal bodies that they can eat. Um, and um, we bring that up often because the truth is that we have more issues in this country, um, as I like to call it, nutrition apartheid and food apartheid that deals with lack of healthy foods that are plant-based. Um, mm -hmm. And so while, you know, having any budget is really a privilege, the truth is that even for someone who has a small budget, it's going to be more accessible to them um, if they're working two to three jobs to stop at McDonald's and buy a dollar meal than to go home. And perhaps even if rice and beans is, um, you know, less expensive, they might not have the time um, currency. And I think that that's something that is lost when we talk mm -hmm. as vegans about food access. We not only have to look at the price of food, but we have to look at the communities, um, whether people have even access to a kitchen. If you're operating from the belief that, have, that someone has access to a kitchen, then you're not understanding food justice work because not everyone has access to a kitchen um, and yeah. not everybody has the same time. And I think not everybody you know, has an air fryer <laughs> and not everybody has an air fryer. And so, you know, in order to work towards this uh, more equitable and just food system for all beings, we have yeah. to understand that complexity of it and how it affects every being that's caught in it. Um, I'm passionate about all aspects of animal activism, but food is just the most horrific uh, system and it's so large and it's so global. And so we have all of these different industries, but food exploits animals just on such a level that it seems almost impossible to take it down, right? And so, and it's not the regular activism where you can go and hold a sign and say, I'm at this protest, which is also needed. I love that. I love being on the street. I love screaming. <laughs> I love doing disruptions. But at the yes. same time, you know, I understand that there is so much work to be done to change our food system towards a plant-based food system. And we cannot ignore it whatsoever. Um, it's, it's, a, it's such a huge part of why animals are a and we can no longer, you know, we don't have um, the luxury and the animals are, are, you know, these beyond human persons don't have the luxury for us to be debating whether something connects or interconnects. We need to do this work and we need to do it now. And we need to be aware um, of what's happening, how these industries are being supported uh, by the government, not just in the U.S. This is a global issue. So um, these subsidies are not just U.S. based. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, um, I just, I have, I agree with everything that you said. And just hearing that is a constant reminder of the large scale of change that needs to be achieved, all that, all that needs to be done moving forward. How do you, how, and you're like, I had addressed, and like you've also addressed, you're involved in so many different forms of activism. How, are you balancing that with your mental health? How are you staying positive? How are you keeping yourself motivated and excited to show up every day? Like what keeps you going in your activism? You know, I think that for me, um, and I mentioned it before, when you think about the folks who are, uh, 
so oppressed when we think about these beyond human persons, about our fellow animals, and beyond that, the you know the human persons who are marginalized. You know, that's my motivation, and I'm very lucky to work within different spaces and and go from grassroots organizing and then break away and work on policy because I think that there's so much challenge um, in grassroots organizing and it's you know it can be very emotional and there's a lot of personalities and yeah. all of that stuff and and so I feel very blessed and very lucky that then I get to go into other spaces where it's a very um, it's a meeting and it's a working meeting and we know what we're trying to do and what the goal is set and there is no space for all of these different personalities it's just like we have this one goal let's get it together right now I'm working on the I always get it wrong uh, healthy future students and earth act and we're trying to get plant-based foods to students across the country which is completely just such a thing that needs to be done I mean I think yeah. we serve seven billion meals in the U.S. alone uh, to kids and you know, our work, um, I work with another organization called Hip Up is Green. And if we're there providing this humane education, talking about our fellow animals, talking about this exploitation and talking about food injustice, and then the kids go to the cafeteria, I mean, completely just ruins the work that we just did. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to get this food into school. So the kids who are already vegan or who may have religious reasons for not eating animals or whatever reasons, are included and then it supports the work of all of these organizations that are really pushing to um, create the, the, the next generation of activists because we're going to get very old one day and we're going to yeah. die. And yeah. so we yeah. cannot keep thinking that this is it. This is, you know, this is our movement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm extremely passionate about school food and about reaching uh, the youth because we need them. We need them out there. And so many of them are so empowered, whether it's, um, you know, environmental justice or food justice. And we need to really um, take advantage of that and work together with our youth and continue to empower them so we have the next generation of folks who are fighting for our fellow animals yeah so um it uh you briefly mentioned hip-hop is green so are is that focused on um also the youth-centered uh education or is that tapping into the hip hop fan community. <laughs> so hip hop, as you know, is a, it's a global phenomenon now, yes. you know, it's, it's known all over the world. And so yes. we're, we've been around 12 years, we're a national organization. And basically, we use the power of music um, to bring about change. And we work with um, kids that are in the city. And we bring we work with the school staff as well. And so we have these green dinners where it's all plant based food. And we do presentations, we bring animal sanctuaries to talk about the animals. Um, we also talk about the history of veganism um, and within their communities. Um, I teach uh, food race and um, colonization. And so we talk about how our food system and our relationship to each other, to the natural world and to other folks who may not be of our own background has been hijacked, right? Yeah. By the system that continues to exploit. Yes, people have exploited animals forever, but they're, you know, whether or not we like to agree um, there is a difference in a system that goes from sustenance to complete exploitation for profit mm -hmm. and we have to understand that nuance um, when we are fighting for our fellow animals and so we talk about that history and we talk about you know coming back to to the land and to um taking what our ancestors gave us and furthering it along right and so that connection to our fellow animals um taking it one step further. Right now, we just started a 10 week, um, I think it's 10 weeks or I'm, I'm not, I don't recall, sustainability program where the kids not only learn uh, plant-based nutrition, food justice, and then they go to the sanctuaries. And so I think we have 28 kids now and out of those 28, 25 are already going vegan. Uh, so wow. it works. Uh, we get kids um, who go to our presentations, who go to the dinners because their parents are there. So we involve the parents, we involve the teachers and so on. And they text 
the the teacher the teachers get texts by the end of the presentation saying you know I want to go vegan um, because they're getting the entirety yeah. of the information and they're you know they feel empowered to affect change within their communities and that's really important and that's why I think it's it's so critical to understand um, the food system and every industry whether you're talking about the fashion industry the entertainment industry that uses animals and really bring it back to those communities because when you feel when you identify with something and you feel you discover something then you're much more motivated to make that change right and yeah. so that's what we see happen um, with our youth and um, we're we're working on a meeting so they can meet with um, policymakers and talk about and by policymakers, I mean our Congress people, yeah. um, and talk about why uh, we need plant-based foods in schools. And these are the kids that just went vegan. So how empowering is that? That you oh, just went vegan and you gosh. get to talk and to. And you get to go up yeah. there and be like, "Hey, you, you're all are drafting these policies. This is what we want because we are the future." And that is, yeah, mm -hmm. that is remarkable. Wow, it's that's, I like what I'm hearing is a. Uh, a parallel of the mentorship that your, um, you know, your family members had on you as a kid, and mm -hmm. you are having that same passion and dedication to have that impact on these kids who are going to, you know, inspire the next generation and keeping it going. So I see that mentorship element as we are the animal activism mentorship program. Mm -hmm. I love that, that, um, just that uh, angle that you brought up and also including the parents and the teachers in the conversation because otherwise it's not going to be sustainable because a lot of times kids don't have the option to just make you know they can't just be like hey mom I want a vegan meal and that's absolutely that doesn't pan out but by including everybody in the process it keeps mm -hmm. it keeps it sustainable yeah and inclusion and equity are you know such a, a huge part of my work and yeah I'm someone that, you know, definitely believes that we should make vegan XM accessible to everyone. And that doesn't just mean through food. It means through yep. providing the education, the empowerment to become active. And, you know, a lot of times when we do street activism is focused in certain areas, you know, but we go to the areas where there might be unhoused folks. We go to the areas where there might be um, communities of lower income because they too need the information. The animals need everybody to get on board. They need everyone to not only go vegan, but become active. And so, you know, there is absolutely zero reason as to why we shouldn't be working on these issues and including everyone. And not, I don't mean from a perspective of, shaming people but understanding where they're at and mm -hmm. and giving them the tools to make that change right Absolutely. and it's about that it's like you know i understand where you're at here are the tools so you can make the change and be an advocate or become vegan definitely wow you have you are doing so much and i know they're only 24 hours in a day and we do need some rest and you are very good about prioritizing that uh, before I let you go, I would love to know, do you have a favorite form of activism among all of the, all of the different projects you're involved in? Oh, that's so tough. Um, I'm an artist that my dad Ooh. was an artist and, you know, I have a history of working in, in organizations mm -hmm. and business and so on. And so I, I think art is, is a huge vehicle for change, um, but I, it depends what mood I'm in. So it's True. terrible, but I can't give you an answer. Sometimes I, That's you know, okay. I Sometimes you feel feisty. You just want to go yeah, in and disrupt exactly. the story. Um, and sometimes that's, you just, yeah. I'm very good at screaming. So there <laughs> I can go. go into a store and just scream at the top of my lungs. And yeah. there are times when policy is what I do. And so I think it, it depends um, what is needed and what mood I'm in, um, and um, just uh, what calls me at that time. I, yeah. I think it's important to listen to that calling um, mm -hmm. and trust that intuition because a lot of times there, you know, we want to 
pull away from certain work that no longer serves us. And if we're doing stuff that no longer serves us in a way, we're no longer going to be able to serve the animals. Mm -hmm. um, and that's such an important part to remember. And it's okay to evolve. Um, it's okay to change strategies. I, I love strategizing. I think that the, the thing that I would answer is, we must consistently and continuously strategize and challenge ourselves and educate ourselves on how to be better activists. Um, so I think my, the best form of activism is um, uh, growing and educating ourselves to become um, better activists each and every day. Oh, that was, that's so beautiful. And um, just out of curiosity, when you're in these food policy meetings, do you refer to it? Um, uh, like animal meat and or any of these products as uh, products that come from animal bodies? Is that how you phrase it? I do. Um, you know, I, 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 I have a, a passion for really, you know, going into the vegan spaces and talking about issues that perhaps vegans are not connecting to animal mm -hmm. liberation and then going into those other spaces that are not uh, centered around our fellow animals and challenging language. Yeah. I love challenging how we use language. I think it's um, yeah. a really important part of social justice. Um, and so I refer to uh, my fellow animals when we talk about food as animals bodies uh, yes, the bodies yes. of animals mm -hmm. and so I, I try to give them that personhood um, in yeah. each and every way that I can Definitely. and you know you'll see in the meetings that I, like or or even with um you know milk um intolerance I'm like yes yeah, so we're lactose normal <laughs> yes and so you know or it's like we've weaned out of exactly. we've weaned off of a cow's lactation yes, secretion exactly in order to continue challenging how people view our fellow animals because if we don't you know if we don't change language if we don't you know change the way that we refer to our fellow earthlings, then we're doing them at this service. And, and I use any way in any space I can to do that. Beautiful. And lastly, Eloisa, what does a just, equitable vegan world look like to you? How do you envision it? <sighs> My, my dream, um, uh, just an equitable vegan world to me means where no one is oppressed, where we all live freely, uh, regardless of our species, um, so human or beyond human, um, and where everyone has access to food that grows from the ground, which is a natural right. We live in a world um, where we have change and develop systems um, where people are excluded and don't even have food to put on the table, um, a world where no animal is exploited, um, a just and fair transition so everybody can have a chance to thrive of all species. Yeah. Lovely. Do you think there will be subsistence hunting in that world? I hope not. And okay. the goal mm -hmm. is that if we focus on food waste, which we waste most of our food that we grow, um, perhaps there won't be a need for any of that. Yeah. I think there's very few people that are actually doing um, this type of hunting. If you live in the USA and you drive a vehicle and you have <laughs> enough money to buy the rest of your food at Walmart and you have a budget, you're not doing that. And yeah. I, I really <laughs> take... Um, I, I really take issue uh, where when people do not define well what that is. And so, you know, please don't tell me or speak to me as if you're living in the middle of an Amazon of the Amazon and you're an uncontacted tribe because that's not what's happening. And so I think that that's where nuance comes in as well. Um, and so hopefully that won't exist. And I think because of the way we develop the food system, if we do work um, towards a more equitable system where we also address the food waste that we have, which we could address it now. I mean, this, the yeah, world totally. could be vegan now um, if we just uh, tackle the issues of poverty and distribution. Um, and we like to say a lot of times, oh, it could be a vegan world if people just stop eating meat. And that's just not exactly the case. We would have to address those issues that keep people from having that food. And part of that is distribution. Part of that is addressing food waste. Part of that is addressing um, what keeps people in that loop of, of poverty as well. So in, in my ideal yeah. <laughs> eyes and brain, yeah. <laughs> I see a world without, without animals being harmed whatsoever. Yes. I, I see us evolving away from having to kill another being in order to live. 
Yes, because just to put minds at ease, the cows are not going to take over the planet tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. They are not <laughs> going to take over the planet. And if they did, you know what? It's okay because we've taken over the planet. I know, and, and, I know. It's not know, it's I, like it. at this point, maybe it's time for another species to give Might it a as shot. well. <laughs> Might as you well. You know, you know, our 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 track record is questionable. I, I love, you know, I love people and I, I love all beings. Um I I'm not a vegan that has this feeling of like, gosh, you know, I just hate humans. Yeah. Humans are challenging creatures. Um, but I think that we can do better and yeah. that we will do better because, you know, there's folks like us and we're fighting and there's going to be more folks and, and the fight will continue until we get there. Yes. I was just going to say people like you always give me hope and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to chat with us. I'm sure all of the resources that you've offered, all the organizations you're involved with, everything's going to be linked in our show notes and people will be inspired to hop on board. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before hopping off? How can people find you? So I'm on Instagram. It's um, Elogata, E-L-O-G-A-T-A. I don't post much. Uh, so follow the organizations, which is a much better way to look at what I do. Uh, so that's Vegan Activist Alliance, uh, Chili's on Wheels, and Hip Up is Green. Uh, the chapter I run of Hip Up is Green is here in New York City, which is the birthplace of hip hop to all the folks that oh, don't fun. know. <laughs> um, How and, cool. Yeah. And so, yeah, just follow the org, support. Um, and the best thing that you can do to follow me is fight for our fellow animals I love that I love that so much I feel like I could keep talking to you but uh, I know time is of the essence so we shall let you go thank you again it's it's a, an incredible honor and I hope to see more of you in this world I had such a great time speaking to you and thank you for all you do and everything at um you know the new organization and we're so glad to collaborate with you all we yeah. need education for our fellow activists uh, we need to support them we need to empower them and yes. um i'm so grateful for all the work that you do absolutely it's our pleasure and we're glad that you are doing so many different forms of activism to show our new mentees and soon to be activists um, that there are different forms of activism that they can be involved in. They just need to follow their calling and Absolutely. decide where and find their niche. So there is yeah. a role for everyone in the fight for liberation. <laughs> 100%. Thank you once again, Eloisa. You are a star. Wow. I am still in awe of all the remarkable work that Eloisa does. As animal rights activists, I understand that we may tend to overlook the suffering of our fellow humans who may not have certain privileges to make the ethical and compassionate choices in their everyday lives that don't harm animals. It can be easy to lose sight of the fact that all liberation is interconnected. Helping one oppressed group in our society does not mean having to ignore uplifting another. And if this episode resonated with you, check out the show notes for the links to all of the groups that Eloisa is involved with. Given her wide range of activism, I'm pretty sure there's something for everyone who aspires to put their best selves forward for the cause. Before we sign off, please take a quick minute to rate and review the podcast. It helps others find it more easily. And the more people who find it, the more they can be inspired by the guests whom we interview on our show and turn that inspiration into actionable change for the animals. And don't forget to check out our website, animalactivismmentorship.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship where you can keep up with the podcast as well as all things AAM. You can also hop in on our clubhouse rooms for stimulating discussions about animal rights, effective tactics and strategies, and all things in between. Accessibility to our content without any hindrance is key to the work we do here at AAM. 
That's why it's important to us that we offer our resources for free. And if you like what we do here at the podcast and at AAM and have the financial ability to do so, please feel free to support us by contributing to our Patreon. It helps keep us going. Last but not least, AAM is so proud and honored to be fueled by FARM. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help you with your activism at animalactivismmentorship.com. If you need a sign that you should become active for the animals, here you go. And remember, it will take all of us to achieve animal liberation. We need all hands on deck, we gotta stay focused, but stay positive, support one another, encourage and uplift one another, and let's be the change of compassion that we envision for this world. Until next time.